would you describe your experience in math education in public schools? Yeah. I heard a <laughs> Okay. To prepare you for my talk, I really want you to think about your experience growing up um, in the math classroom. How did you feel? So let's try this again. Oh, there we go. Relationships are powerful. I would argue that we all desire to know our relationship to the universe, to the world, and to each other in some way. And humans have used narratives for thousands of years to understand the great interconnectedness in the universe. Narratives are just about relationships, how people relate to a time and a place and a situation. And the combination of all of the people in our lives and the times and the places and the situations have molded us to be unique and specific. Please allow me to share some of my story with you and why I'm so passionate about math education and how I see that relationships really hold the key to unlocking amazing, almost limitless potential for our economy, for our society, and really for all of us. When I tell people I'm a math teacher, I hear one of three statements. I'm just bad at math, I hated math, or I like math because there's one right answer. Now, these are either negative or very limited views of mathematics. Mathematics can be incredibly complex and beautiful and useful and amazing. It is my desire to help everyone see and believe that they can learn mathematics. And I think that the thread through my entire talk, through all of these ideas that you're going to hear, is relationships. So, I think that math is the language of relationships, or it's a language of relationships. A lot of people say, well, math is the language of numbers. Ah, oh, it's much more than that, because what are numbers? They're a relationship. It's a, oh, it's a language of patterns, but what are patterns? They're relationships. So really, it's a language of relationships. And math talks about objects and operations and qualities, just exactly like our spoken language uses nouns and verbs and adjectives. It's exactly the same. And that math simply looks at the relationships between objects and operations and the qualities between all of these things. So let me show you two examples. One simple, one a little bit more complex. Here's a simple example. Three plus four equals seven. We see the relationship between the objects, the numbers, and they are related through the operation of addition and there is some equality there. Now, the quality is three is less than four, and both are less than seven. We could come up with a simple sentence that's very similar to this. Now, here's a little bit more complicated example. <laughs> nobody flinched, nobody, nobody got scared, peed their pants, okay, that's good. These are called the Lorenz equations. And these are a set of three differential equations. It creates a complex dynamic system, a coupled system, we should say. And we can see here that the x, the y, the z, and the t, they are all the variables. And they are all related together through these three equations. And the change of the variable is related to the other variables. Now, this may look very scary. In my opinion, these three equations create one of the most beautiful and elegant graphs in all of mathematics. The Lorenz attractor. Now, this graph shows the movement of a particle in our atmosphere. Look at it. It's, it's beautiful. It looks like a butterfly, doesn't it? Well, it has a connection with what's known as the butterfly effect, which normally goes something like, if a butterfly flaps its wings in Brazil, it will make it rain in New York months later. This serves to remind us that a small change in the input can have a very large change in the output, that a small change in the beginning can have an extremely large change in the end. And our math education system is a dynamic, chaotic, coupled system. A small change in the beginning can have a large change in the end. I think the problems that we face now, that we have faced, and that we will face, can be phrased in these three ways. How we relate to our planet, how we relate to each other, and how we as individuals relate to ourselves. 
Now, I think this last one holds amazing potential to unlock our creative problem-solving capacity. But it requires that we understand more truth about ourselves. So I'm going to frame truth in this way. Truth is the combination of facts and relationship. We must have facts and relationship. If we have one, there is no truth. That facts must be connected with relationships. I think for too long, math education has focused almost solely on facts and very little about education, or sorry, about relationships. And I think that if students come out of our math education system believing that the only important thing is about passing tests, that's like people believing that the only important thing in a romantic relationship is sex. It's just not true. It takes many things to balance a healthy, romantic relationship. And we have to balance and combine all of those pieces to have a robust and sustainable relationship. I think that for too long, our math education system has pushed the most efficient algorithm instead of exploring making sense together. I think that for too long, our math education system has been about converging students thinking to the right answer instead of creatively looking at models and ways that we understand things mathematically. For too long, math education has been about the destination and not the journey. And for too long, our math education system has made students feel dumb about math, that they can't learn it, instead of helping them approach it with fascination and awe. It's my desire to change this. I have seen all of this in our public schools. But to, to take a phrase from Einstein, sorry, from Newton, <laughs> I stand on the shoulders of giants. That I want to share some of the research from people that have really helped me understand the way that I see learning and I see math education. And the thread that weaves all of these together is relationships. And it creates a tapestry, interconnected, woven together, on which we can place our thoughts and our understanding. So we're going to launch into this. This is Joe Bowler. Joe Bowler is a researcher at Stanford University. What she looks at is how students relate to each other and how students relate to the content. What she has found in her research is that students need more opportunities to discuss and talk about the mathematics and that students need rich, engaging, open-ended tasks where they can really explore what's going on to make sense instead of just find the right answer. So Joe Bowler's work reminds us that students need more opportunities to relate to their peers and to the content. This is Angela Duckworth. Angela Duckworth started out as a math teacher and was so curious and interested in her students that had so much perseverance that she became a psychologist. What she found is that her students that persevered the most usually learned the most math. Now, all of her understanding has crystallized into this word, grit. Now, grit is important in math because math is hard. Thinking deeply is hard work. And it takes perseverance to solve problems. A little side note here. Lots of educational thinkers and writers love to point to the Finnish education system as one of the top education systems in the world. They've got to figure it out. Well, the Finnish have a word that is extremely similar to grit. Sisu. Now, from what I understand, this one word can encapsulate the entire Finnish culture, the Finnish spirit, and the way that they envision and think about education. I think there is a deep relationship there of why they are one of the top education systems in the world and why this word explains the Finnish spirit. The work of Elizabeth Cohen and Rachel Lotan looks at how students work together. It focuses on equitable access to the content, status in the classroom, and equitable group work. And what they have found is that if group work is designed to reduce status and get rid of a hierarchy of dumb and smart students, but to give more access to students, to the content, but also access to talk to each other, that more students learn more math 
at a higher level. This shows the relationship between the student to student and the students to the content. And not only are they learning more math, they're learning how to better work together. This is Carol Dweck. Dweck's work focuses on what is known as mindset. And what she found in her research is that people relate to something like math or drawing or running in one of two ways, with a fixed mindset or with a growth mindset. A person with a growth mindset, she will believe that through hard work and effort, she can learn, she can grow, and she can get better. And that challenge is a good thing because it helps you grow, it helps you get smarter. Now, a person with a fixed mindset believes that they have natural talent or they don't. And that effort is a bad thing because it, it makes you see that you don't have the natural talent and that you shy away from challenge because that might reduce your status so you don't want to face up to challenge. Now, this comes down to a belief about the self. What do people believe about themselves? This is the relationship of a person to the self. So I want to throw a mathematician in here. This might seem a little odd, but this is Benoit Mandelbrot. Benoit Mandelbrot was the mathematician that formalized the study and the idea of what are known as fractals. Here are three simple examples. Fractals are processes or structures that are created through very simple rules, but can create amazingly complex systems. A triangle on triangles on triangles, a stick on stick on sticks, or a circle within circles within circles. The same rule is applied again and again and again, maybe to infinity. Now, fractals are very important here because nature self-organizes using fractals. It's all around us. Now, I believe that fractal structures are indicators of robust and sustainable systems. They are always there. We can work with them or can, we can work against them. Now, here is my idea. Relationships have fractal structure. Here we see a relationship within a relationship within a relationship within a relationship. And at the very center of this fractal of relationships is the student's relationship to the self. And whatever is going on in that relationship is perpetuated and magnified to the outer rings. For example, if a student relates to himself with a fixed mindset, then maybe he will relate to his group with low status. And those, that relationship will be perpetuated to all of the outer rings. And if the words go off the page, how far does it go? Now, this comes back to a belief about the self. Now, you might be asking, well, there's no belief in math, right? I mean, math is about logic and evidence and proof. Well, I beg to disagree. This is Kurt Gödel. And Kurt Gödel made what I believe one of the most creative and powerful proofs in all of mathematics, the incompleteness proof. And his proof shows that in a system of thinking like mathematics, there is at least one thing that is true but cannot be proven. It leaves the option for belief, the space for belief. So I ask, what do we believe about our students? And what do we desire from our math education system? Do we desire to believe this? We are smarter together than we are alone. Do we desire to live that out? I desire to show people that they can learn math and to help them believe that they can learn math. And if they can learn math, they can learn damn near anything. I desire to create a fair and more accessible system of math. A system of math education where students balance the relationship between convergent and divergent thinking, between economic wants and social needs where students see that the arts will complement, enhance, and grow their understanding of, math of mathematics, making it more powerful and beautiful, where students see that empathy is more important than equations, where grit is more valuable than grades, and where compassion 
is more important than calculus. Where students are driven by curiosity and not by tests. Where people want to become engineers because they can solve important social problems. Not just make cool stuff and get lots of money. I desire to show that if we inspire students, and if we give them a passion and a curiosity for a subject, they will teach themselves and they will learn from each other and no person or no thing and no situation and no time will stop them. This is what I desire. And I believe that this is truly what math education has to offer us. Thank you.